All right, hey, welcome everybody. This is Vaughn with Spirit of Health. We're at the Children's Health Fair 2018. I'm gonna introduce Troy uh, with US Enzymes. So the whole focus of the conference is on children. Enzymes um, are amazing. I've used enzymes for years. When I found out about US Enzymes, I got really excited because they have the purest, they have the best. I've seen them help a lot of people with a lot of issues, not necessarily specific for kids. I've worked a lot with adults with enzymes to help clear blocked arteries and clean up scar tissue and help with obviously digestion and things like that. But since we've started using US Enzymes, we just hear more and more great stories of how great their product works. Troy, um, you're not, are you the founder of the company? Yep. Oh, so Troy's the founder of the company. I know he does a lot of extreme, um, I don't know what you want to call it, extreme sports, sports I guess, but like, like going to one end of the Grand Canyon and back and back in 24 hours, right? Yep. And climbing to the top of mountains. And he's just found like how he can do these things and how he can recover so much more quickly uh, using enzymes. And that's kind of part of his story, but I'll let him share that. So we're really excited to have Troy here and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Vaughn. All right. So um, reach your peak. So obviously as human beings, um, you know, that would be a desirable goal, right? I mean, to, get, to utilize all your God-given gifts while you're here. So um, that's really kind of the, the, the basis or the foundation. And I'm a firm believer in that you have to do it, right? This isn't like you can just sit there and think it up. So this is one of my favorite cartoons. So it says, why is it that people who are happy are busy enjoying it and people who are unhappy are busy talking about it, right? So there's that difference between you can talk about something, but then you have to go do it, right? So that's, that's the main difference here. Uh, and, and this is one of my favorite little charts here. So this is super important just from the perspective of if you want to reach your peak, right, what, what do you have to do in order to get to the high point in your life? Do, do you see something here? A little pattern? You're going to have to go through your deepest, darkest hour, right? So you're going to have to reach your absolute low point and whatever threshold you have to do that, right? The more, I mean, if you want to call it pain or suffering, whatever that is that you're willing to go through, the greater this high. These are, these are directly correlated. So, and I'll explain some stories um, that'll illuminate that for you. Uh, this is a, in the Bible, it talks about as a man thinketh or as a woman thinketh in this case, um, you know, so, so is she. So this is a great book that talks really about, you know, developing your, your mental and your mindset and your attitude in life, which I think is super important. So uh, we're gonna start with an enzyme overview. Does anybody really know what an enzyme is? Yeah, people, people confuse what an enzyme is and what it does. So, you know, from, from, from the simplest perspective, an enzyme is a protein molecule that has an electrical charge attached to it. So what I think is really fascinating, right, no accident here, is that that protein molecule is a vehicle for the energy to do what it needs to do while it's here, right? So what, what's the human body? It's a protein molecule, right? It's a, it's a protein organism. It's a vehicle, right, that there's energy that sits on top of that that you know, we're here to do what we're supposed to do. So an enzyme and a human being, I mean, you can't separate those two, they, they mimic each other, right? So it's just a smaller version. So if you look in the human body, to date, five to 8,000 different enzymes have been identified. So, so they're found in all living things. So is, is lava a living thing that comes out of a volcano? Some people say no, why well, say it is? There are enzymes found in lava, right? So just as an extreme example, but, but you know, for the most part, plants, you know, animals and human beings, right? We're all living things, we all contain enzymes. And enzymes are responsible for every single chemical reaction in the body, there are no exceptions to that. So a great definition, my favorite definition uh, of life is, is an orderly and integrated succession of enzymatic reactions. So if you were to wait, kind of like peel away the, the skin of the body, or if you were able to kind of put on some uh, 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 enzyme x-ray glasses, all you'd see is just a series of reactions. I'm like, like millions of them every second. Because every time you blink your eye, are you consciously doing that? Your, your brain's functioning, right? You're having all these, th all these thoughts while you're sitting there. Your heart's beating, all of your organs are running. You're not doing any of that, right? That's all being governed by enzymes. 
Uh, in fact, at least 50% of the protein that we take in every day, the body converts that into enzymes. So that's why it's important as far as the proteins that we're taking in and is the body able to break those down, like, like Vaughn mentioned, into amino acids, right? Um, so that your body can reconfigure those and use those to recuperate um, and regenerate the body. So um, this, is the, this is the other thing. So this is a warehouse for enzymes. If there are five to 8,000 different enzymes, can this, can this small warehouse house all of those enzymes? Probably not. It's not any different than if you were to go to uh, like a manufacturing facility that you see there, there are you know, hundreds of different, different raw materials on the shelf so they can take those different raw materials and make quite literally thousands or hundreds of thousands of different formulas. So again with the human body because we have limited space um, the body stores base enzymes and those base enzymes can be converted into different enzymes as needed. Okay, enzymes are energy, so that's that's the, the main point I want to get across today, is and and we're going to talk about different types of energy in the body, but really they're one and the same. So how many people here want more energy? <laughs> right, because why do we eat food? Besides for social reasons. It, right, the energy that's contained in that food is there's only one way to get to that, right, and that's through an enzyme. So whatever energy is in that food, it has to go through an enzymatic process in order for you to enjoy that energy or use it. So and again, we talked about this protein molecule um, catalyzes chemical reactions of other substances without itself being destroyed or altered upon completion of those reactions. That's a, that's a mind boggling definition. So what they're saying is that an enzyme can go over here and perform a function and it's not affected by doing that. So if I was to go over here and do something, that I would be affected by it, right? That would cost me some energy to run over here and do something and come back. It doesn't cost an enzyme ener any, any, any energy, right? It just keeps performing the same functions time and time again. We'll give you some more specific examples. We always talk, another great analogy is a battery. So when you buy or purchase a battery, are you buying it because it looks pretty? or it's got a copper top on it. No, you're, it's what's inside, right? The energy, that's what you're after. So it's the same thing with enzymes. And these are some interesting just kind of depictions of what an enzyme looks like because all enzymes are tetrahedrons, right? They're four-sided pyramids. This is one way to um, uh, depict that. Here's another way, uh, and here's a, here's a simpler way. So again, that's, that's the shape of the enzyme and then all the energy is contained at certain points in the enzyme. So if you look at human life, right, we start human life with the most amount of enzymes and then as we age, right, those enzymes get used up, very similar with our energy levels, right? As we age, we have less and less energy. So those are, those are definitely co correlated. So we're going to talk about the five, like, energy aspects of what enzymes do. So the first and foremost, the most important thing is that they act as a catalyst. So what does a catalyst do? It, it speeds things up, right? So without a catalyst, and this is, these, are, these are great, um, these, this has been documented. So a reaction without an enzyme would normally take 78 million years to occur. One reaction. You have to wait 78 million years, it happens. You add one enzyme to that equation, it happens in 20 milliseconds. What's a millisecond? It's where you chop a second into a thousand pieces and it only takes 20 of those to get it done. It's, it's almost, it's quicker than I can snap my fingers, right? Okay, the average enzyme catalyzes between 100 and 1,000 reactions every single second. <laughs> like women are awesome at multitasking, right? I mean, they are, they are, they are so much better than guys, right? But I go, I'm sorry, but you know, can you do 100 to 1,000 th things a second? I mean, you wished you probably could, right? <laughs> enzymes do that. So in a, an extreme example, so there's an enzyme called catalase, and it hy hydrolyzes five million bonds in one second. The amount of energy that's contained in an enzyme 
is incomprehensible. I mean, and again, once it breaks those 5,000 bond, 5 million, sorry, 5 million bonds in one second, did that, was that impacted or affected by doing that? No, so the very next second, what does it do? It chews up another 5 million bonds, right? It just keeps doing this, so it's, it's amazing what, what, what enzymes can do. This is, a, this is a very simple depiction. So if, if this is the enzyme, that's the molecule that needs to be broken down. The enzyme attaches itself to that, splits it into two pieces, and then is it affected? No. So it just runs back up here, grabs another one, and does the exact same thing. So I just, it's hard to imagine it doing that a thousand or five million times every second. Okay, so the second aspect um, goes into how we react and, and with the energy that we can get from the environment. So um, the first is respiration uh, and the second is ATP. So all energy found in the human body is transformed and stored by enzymes through two, two major pathways. So the first one is how we react with oxygen, right? The body's able to take that in, convert it, right? So that we can breathe and have breath. Um, that, that's all controlled by enzymes. And then the second one is through, like a, people are familiar with ATP or the citric acid cycle. So that's just how the body produces energy. All, that whole process is controlled and governed by enzymes. People wonder how, this is, this is the kind of the second part to that. How does the body um, maintain its temperature? Has anybody ever asked yourself, ask yourself that? Like how can it just stay at, at the same temperature all the time? Well, it, it's enzymes. Enzymes are slowly, they store that energy and then they slowly release it so that it maintains the body temperature. So what happens when you get sick? Does the temperature go up? Why does it go up? Right, so from an enzyme perspective, the vast majority of enzymes work, at, like right now at, at normal body temperature, the enzymes are kind of humming along at let's say 70% efficiency. So they're just kind of skating by. So enzymes work at their at 100% efficiency at 104 degrees. Why does the body raise its temperature? So it increases enzyme activity so that it can heal itself, right? So what happens when our body reaches 100, 101, 102? What are we running for? Yeah, something to bring it back down, right? Because we're like, oh, we're gonna die. No, the body, un the body understands, right? It's gonna take it up to 104, and, I, and, and what you can do during that time is that you take more enzymes, right? So it reaches 104 temperature. Whatever that is, it's gonna, it's gonna break like within a day, and then boom, you're on the healing side. But again, all, all that's gonna do by taking some kind of other drug is gonna slow that down, right? So again, we talked about without, without the enzymes regulating body temperature, then we kind of go back and forth, right, between being super hot and super cold. So another important piece as far as energy in the body, anytime two uh, molecules come together and there's a reaction, there's a, there has to be a, a certain amount of energy put into that reaction initially in order to get it started, right? So like you're sitting there, right? is a good example. So it doesn't require a lot of energy, right? But for you to get up, right, that in, there has, you have to put some energy into getting up. And now once you're standing up, does it take it as much energy? No, it kind of goes back down. So same thing with enzyme reactions, that there has to be a certain amount of energy put into it, then it happens. So um, enzymes reduce that energy dramatically. Because um, if we were, look, we use this as an example, those 5 million hydrogen peroxide molecules that catalase can break down in one second. Um, you know, 18,000 calories per molecule is the amount of energy needed times that many molecules would leave you 90 billion calories. That's a lot of energy. I don't know if there's 90 billion calories if we ate everything on the planet, right? So all that's contained in enzymes. The energy is provided, there's nothing additional needed. And then here, it reduces that energy by 90% and a lot of reactions happen spontaneously. What does that mean? It sounds like magic, right? It just, it just happens. Like, and that's, that's how scientists explain it. Like, you add an enzyme to it, it just happens. It's like, okay, that's pretty fascinating. 
This is just a graph that shows that normally you have to put a lot of energy to get, get up over and make that reaction happen. Enzymes just cut that in half and, and make it happen like that. Fourth thing, uh, enzymes are incredibly efficient. So uh, one tablespoon of pepsin can digest 4,000 pounds. Are we going to be eating that much food? Maybe in our lifetime, right? But if you think about that, like all the food you could eat in an entire lifetime, all you would need is one tablespoon of that enzyme to digest all of that. Pretty profound. Um, the law of adaptive secretion uh, was established in 1943 that just simply says the body recognizes the value of enzymes and will not produce one extra enzyme that it does not need, right? It values it so much. So like if you ate a piece of uh, fish, right, and you needed 43 enzymes to digest that piece of fish, how many enzymes will the body produce? 43, right, that's it. So just an example, so you've got our little um, teaspoon here and we have a truckload, right, so pretty, pretty, pretty impressive. This is, this is the coolest part of enzymes, at least from my perspective, studying them for 25 years, is that enzymes produce a certain type of light. It's uh, called bioluminescence. It could be called biophotons. There was a doctor maybe 50 years ago, uh, Dr. Pop, that, that said this. And of course, he was ridiculed and kind of laughed off the university campus. So it took quite a few years to actually prove it. And, and uh, Japanese researchers did this in 2009 and again in 2012. So with the, with the cool cameras and things that we have available today, they can take pictures and prove that the body emits light. So that we're light beings, right? Awesome stuff. So enzymes are responsible for that. And we, you know, we see that out in nature with, with fireflies. We see that with all the creatures where there is no light at the bottom of the ocean. They create their own and it's all through an enzymatic process. And this is, this is just a, one fascinating um, aspect of the enzyme research that's going on. So the, the green uh, item in the slide here is a piece of cellulose, which is plant fiber. All the little red dots here are cellulase, which is the enzyme that breaks down plant fiber. So scientists are now able to see like how enzymes work, right? From like, it's almost like uh, if you were to, uh, you know, zoom back and you're looking from God's perspective and you can see, you know, all these human beings like little ants, right, running around building something or tearing something apart, this would be the same thing, that we're kind of looking down at these little enzymes and you're seeing how they break the bonds, when they break the bonds, how they work as a, as a, as a, as a team. So it's, it's very fascinating stuff. Okay, so through this light that the enzymes emit, I mean, Communication that happens within the body. I mean, uh, again, do people ask these, ask themselves these questions? Because how do if if you have eight trillion cells in your body, how do they talk to each other? I mean, are they you know calling up on cell phones saying, hey, I need to you know two of you protein guys up down here you know right away, or are they texting saying, hey, you know get over here right away, you know because you read text and not necessarily answer your phone, right? So, but no, I mean, there's no time for any of that. So, I mean, light travels. At, at, at what speed? <laughs> at the speed of light. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost instantaneous, right? So that, that's, how, that's how communication happens. I mean, because if you look at two billion seconds in the average person's lifespan, right? Um, that equals, so you have a thousand reactions per second in every cell times eight trillion cells in the human body times two billion seconds in a normal lifespan. You have, s what, 16 bazillion reactions. I mean, I mean, how can those all communicate? I mean, that, that's all done at the speed of light, you know, utilizing enzymes. So again, then you say, okay, there's seven billion human beings on the planet now. That's a lot of communication, right? A lot of stuff going on. So again, yeah, just kind of the electrical grid of the body. So people always ask, you know, why take digestive enzymes? And this is, this is ubiquitous. I mean, so it, from, a, from a baby all the way through someone that's, you know, uh, retired and, and, you know, at the end of the life cycle. So 
we, we talked about this already. I mean, en enzymes increase energy levels. We're gonna, and those, those five examples we gave you are, are part of that. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Obviously, if you have any digestive issues, those get eliminated. So if you have gas, you have bloating, you have you know, intestinal discomfort, th those all go away. Um, absorb more nutrients, right? The first iteration way back was you are what you eat. And then the second iteration is what? Yeah. You are what you digest, right? And now the third iteration that we did a study on is you are what you absorb, right? So we've gotten you know, more, more sophisticated and we have a better understanding of what's going on. So you're definitely gonna absorb more of the food that you're eating. Uh, diminished food allergies, most, and not just food allergies, but airborne allergies, most of those are protein based. So if you're digesting and assimilating proteins very completely and efficiently, you're just not gonna have those issues. Um, anybody interested in slowing the aging process? <laughs> See, women especially, right? Yeah, woo! I mean, you know, guys not so much, but I mean, women are seriously interested in that. So, uh, so again, we, we look at the typical American diet, right? So, and these, these are just the glasses that I wear 24 seven, because I look at everything from an enzyme perspective. So are there any enzymes found in this, this meal? No, so anytime you cook something over 118 degrees, all the enzymes have been denatured or killed, right? So you can't go in there and, you know, you know, there's no CPR, there's no bringing them back. I mean, once, once that's happened, they're dead and gone. So you eat this, what happens? Where, where do the enzymes come from to digest this? Your body, right? Your pancreas has to produce those. So if you look at, you know, and scientists vary a little on this, but 50 to 70% of your energy every day goes to digest your food. This is out of whack. So what happens to your brain functions after you eat a huge meal? Are you thinking really sharp? I mean, do you have your best ideas right after you eat a huge meal? <laughs> no. That's a no-go. I mean, you're checked out. I mean, it's unplugged. Looks like your brain is, you just unplug your brain and, uh, you know what I'm saying? So metabolic functions, right? I mean, your heart rate, your kidney functions, liver functions, you know, all that stuff's put on the back burner. You know, what about your immune system? Yeah, that's put on, put on hold as well. I mean, digestion always takes precedent. That's the body's first priority. So if you put food in there, forgets everything else, it digests that, once that's done, then it goes back to doing these other functions. So how many times a day do we do this? At least three, yeah, three to five times a day. So, and, and just from my perspective, this is just a misallocation of your energy. If that's how much energy you have in a day, would you really wanna give 70% of that to digesting your food? No, there's some really cool things I wanna do in life, right, that I'd rather do than digest food so this was the, the study that we did on astrozyme. So this was just to deal with a, you know, a digestion and absorption. So it's kind of taken it to the next level. So first thing we did is we made sure that the enzymes digest protein. So that's what it does. And it's important that it does it in a wide pH range. So anywhere from 90 to 96% of the, the protein was digested, right? Within 30 to 60 minutes. That's the first task. But the more important task is once those are broken down, what is the body doing with them, right? So with the quantity of peptides increased by 41%, right? The absorption, that's huge. That's almost twice as many peptides absorbed. Um, the rate, how quickly those are absorbed, went up by 30%. Okay, this one's messed up, I, I screwed up. So it's down here, it's amino acids. So again, we saw a 30% increase in the rate of absorption of amino acids. And as far as the quantity of amino, amino acids, it went up by 60%. So these are huge, right? Now you're talking your body can, can not just break those down, but it can actually you know, reconfigure them and utilize them to rebuild the body. So this was an important study. And that's, that's one way. How many people here are gonna like alter their diet after hearing this seminar and eat nothing but you know, raw food or raw fermented foods. Zero, I promise you, no one's gonna do that, right? Um, and even I haven't done that. So that's why people go, oh, you must eat 100% raw food, 100%, you know, raw fermented foods. I'm like, sorry, you know, I don't. So there's only two avenues you have. I mean, one, if you're gonna eat those kind of foods, 
you balance the equation by taking a digestive enzyme, right? So you don't have that kind of set, you're not wasting 70% of your energy digesting food. Otherwise, you, you start adding, right, raw foods or raw fermented foods to your diet. I mean, are there enzymes found in, in this type of food? Yeah. Yeah, all your raw foods contain enzymes. Now, people ask this question a lot. So I'm gonna eat this salad, but I'm also gonna have a steak. So the enzymes from the salad are gonna jump over here and digest the steak, right? No, it's a no-go. So there are enough enzymes. Again, the, the nature knows, like in this tomato, yeah, if there's, if, there's, you know, th if there's three enzymes that are needed to break down what's in the tomato, there are only three enzymes in there. That's it, there's nothing extra. Now, what happens when you ferment foods? Is anybody eat fermented foods? Uh, kimchi, sauerkraut, you know, kefirs, all those kind of things. Yeah, so what happens there is that the enzymes eat whatever that is and digest it. So are there extra enzymes in that kind of food? Yes, yeah. Because everything's pre-digested. There's nothing, there's nothing left to do there and there's a bunch of enzymes. So when you eat that, there's actually extra enzymes in those types of foods. So again, you eat that salad, this is, this is what it looks like. So maybe now, you know, your brain's functioning at 25% capacity, you know, your metabolic functions, your immune functions, and then your digestive has been shrunk down to maybe 25%. So is that a, is that a little better? Yeah. So you, you can probably uh, think better, right? And uh, your, 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 your bodily functions handle better, and of course, you're not gonna get sick. So lots, lots of good reasons to balance that out. So, like I said, it's, it's all about the energy, right? And that's why enzymes are so important. And uh, it, it depends on, you know, where you wanna, how you wanna live your life, right? Because each, each of us has that choice, right? So, you know, like for me, I, I mean, why settle for be, being merely effective when you could be insanely awesome, right? There's a, there's a little difference there, right? So, yeah, like I, I've lived my life, you know, and I've lived a pretty extraordinary life. And um, enzymes have, have played a major, major role in that. I mean, people ask, how did I, how did I get involved with enzymes? And it was uh, because I want, to, I want, and I still to this day, there's a lot of things I want to do physically. And, and I want the energy to be able to go do those things. So, and that's true for everybody here, right? So... Um, you know, one of, my, one of my goals was to climb the seven summits. So is anybody familiar with the seven summits? It's, it's the highest mountain on each of the seven continents. So it's, it's, a, it's an elite club. Um, like there's, there's, there's less than 250 people in the world that have done that, right? So the average time it takes to complete that is eight years, right? Because most people can only do one peak every year and then you, do you always get to the top of the peak the first time? Oh no, no, that rarely happens. You gotta go back and do a couple of peaks, so that's why it takes eight years. Any idea, you know, as far as a, a time commitment to do this? Some of, the, some of the peaks, obviously you have to travel around the world, right, but it's the time commitment. Some of these peaks take anywhere from a month to two months to climb. So who can afford to take off two months and go climb? Right? And then if you don't get to the top of that, then you have to go back and do it again, right? So huge time commitment, huge energy commitment. What kind of energy would it take to go do this? Well, I mean, I'm gonna show you. Um, so <laughs> se 17 people in the world have done it in less than four years and only three people in, in the US, right? So it's, 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 it takes a lot. So, you know, I started this venture in 2005 and this is a cool thing too, just from the fact of like it talks about your mindset and setting goals. So I set the goal that I'm gonna go do this. Now, did I have the money to do it? How much does this cost to do, by the way? Ballpark. Throw some numbers up. More. 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 Two hundred and two hundred fifty thousand dollars to go do this. Now you know why there's only two hundred fifty people that have done it. <laughs> I go. I mean, not just the energy, right? Because you have to have the energy and you have to have the time to do it, but you have to have the money to do it, right? So, how did? I, so why did I do this peak first? No, it's the cheapest. <laughs> I didn't have the money. 
I don't, I didn't have that kind of, I was like, are you, right? So that's what happens when you throw your hat over the wall and go, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm committed no matter what, I'm doing it. So I, I said that and I, and then I, I, I went and did the, the least expensive one I could do. So that's the one that, this is in Russia. So um, went and did this peak and the, the lesson on this peak and this is, you know, again, like for you as well as your children, right? It's like you have to be present every moment, right? Especially on stuff like this, because what happens if you, if like, if your mind wanders, what happens? You could die, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's a consequence. <laughs> so, so on this peak. And you don't finish. Yeah, yeah. Challenge. The challenge is is over. Um, <laughs> So what happened on this peak is there was a young, I got to the summit and I'm coming back down and there's a younger kid kind of like on my heels and I'm like, ooh, I don't, I don't like to be rushed. I'm just, you know, hey. So I just, you know, stepped aside and said, you know, go ahead, right? I mean, he didn't take but maybe five steps, tripped over his, his crampons, right? And then he, he, his ice axe wasn't attached to anything. So he tried to put it in the ground and then he slid off backwards, head first, right? And I was like, I've never seen that before. And, and you have no idea how quickly something picks up speed, right? It, I mean, went from zero to probably 50 miles an hour in just a couple of seconds. And you're just like, wow, the only redeeming, the only reason he lived is that the, the, this, this uh, has two peaks and there's a little valley in between. So he slid down and landed in the, in the little saddle. Yeah, it took him a few seconds, right? Got up and like, left. <laughs> I mean, he, he probably finished his climbing career, right? But again, if you're not present in the moment, things like that happen. So the, the next one that I could afford to do, right, was Aconcagua. So this is, this is quite a bit bigger. So that first peak is like maybe 18,000 feet. This is 23,000 feet. So it's almost like climbing a whole nother mountain. Uh, and what the lesson on this one is like to help other people. Right, so um, I got to the summit late in the day, like way later than I thought because this was, you know, I kind of underestimated it a little bit. I get up there, I get to the very top and there's a gentleman up there wearing like a two-piece uh, nylon running outfit, right? Uh, <laughs> I looked, I'm like, how did you get up here, right? Or what are you doing up here? It's like four o'clock in the afternoon, there's nobody around and he's like, he comes over to me, he goes, can you help me back down? And I'm like, well, you know, yeah, I can do that. But he just had a couple of plastic water bottles. And I mean, nothing. I mean, there's no backup plan, zip Ola. So, you know, I, I took a few pictures and did all that. And then, you know, helped him all the way back down to that camp. But it was like, wow, I just think, okay, if I wasn't, you know, because most guys would have turned around. You, you don't summit that late. But if I would have turned around, I mean, he wouldn't have made it. You, you can't live at 23,000 feet for, you know what I'm saying, with, with what he had on and not die of hypothermia. So it was just a, it was a, great, a great lesson. Um, most people are familiar with Kil Mount Kilimanjaro yeah. in Africa. So this is the most climbed mountain on Earth. 20,000 people climb it every year. How many people get to the top? Half. Only 10,000, right? So this is, this is and I, it almost happened to me. And the, the lesson on this mountain is that don't underestimate, right? Like, like your goal. So this, this oh, it's, it's on the equator. It's really warm. It's really easy. You know, 10,000 people get to the top every year. I mean, no, I mean, this, this, was, this was brutal. Absolutely brutal. And I almost didn't make it. So you really gotta, you know, stay focused and, and whatnot. Um, and th those are all relatively inexpensive, right? And, and the interesting thing that happened as these trips came up, do you know what happened with, with, with my, my, um, uh, my company? Suddenly people were placing bigger and bigger orders, right? And, and like right before I went to this, because this is a very expensive trip to go down to the Antarctica, it's like a customer placed this huge order and I was like, thank you. Right, it's just how that works, right? Because you 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 committed to doing it, and the, you know, and and the universe and God supports that, right? There's some some something in that. So with this, the the lesson is patience. So you fly all the way down to Punta Arenas, Chile, which is the southernmost city, and then you fly a it's almost like a, a cargo Russian cargo uh, plane over and land on the ice, in the Antarctica, but. 
we had to wait 26 days. There was 26 days of bad weather where the plane couldn't fly. So you're sitting in Punta Arenas for 26 days. I'm like, a lot of people just left, right? Because they, they just didn't have the patience to wait it out. So then the plane flies over there, lands on the, on the, on the ice, and then you take another plane over to the base of the mountain, and then actually climbing the mountain takes about four or five days, that's it. But it's all you know having the patience and the timing to do that. So, and the other amazing thing about this place is that it's, it's untouched. I mean, everything, the, the main camp that you camp at, they, they fly everything in in November and take everything off in February. You can only climb for three months out of the year. And, 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 you, and you go number one into a 55 gallon drum and you go number two into a 55 gallon drum, all that stuff comes off the continent, right? So it's, it's just impeccably, beautifully maintained. Okay, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a discrepancy between the, the fifth peak. Some people consider this peak in Australia the highest peak in, uh, in Oceania. And then there's Karsten's Pyramid. So there's, there's actually eight summits. So I did all eight just to make sure there was no, you know, nobody can tell me I didn't do it. <laughs> so um, this, this one, anybody in here could do, I promise you. So, so you, it's a, it's a it's the, uh, ski resort. So if you want, I mean, it was cheating, but you can take the lift up, right, get off, and then there's a little trail right over to the summit. And in fact, there were, there were um, uh, babies in little baby carriages, you know, up here. So I just had to ask them if they could move that over so I could take a, a mountaineering photo. <laughs> but but, but from, the, from, the, from the parking lot to the summit, it was just, it's a two-hour hike. That's it. So you can tell them, you know, wearing super technical, you know, shorts, <laughs> you know, and a little windbreaker. That was it. So really the lesson here is just have some fun, right? So that, that was the, the, fun, the fun peak. Okay, so this was the, what I consider the real fifth summit. So this, this is the only, out of all the climbs, this is technical rock climbing. So these are the things you see in the movies where guys are scaling up vertical walls. So this is, this is a f a like maybe, it's between four and 5,000 feet of just vertical straight up. So if you, don't, if you don't know how to climb, right, you don't go do this peak. That's why a lot of people go do the one in Australia and say, yep, yeah, I'm good, right? So um, my background is in technical climbing. So I did that for four years, instructed it for four years. That's my strength. I mean, I, I feel best when I, when I can touch the rock, right? There's that connection. So um, beautiful experience. The, the, the issue here is, is, uh, is uh, um, access. So you, you fly from Australia to Jakarta and then from Jakarta over to Tamika, Papua New Guinea. Uh, and you get there, and they they um, they left my luggage back in Australia. Wow! This is a technical rock climb, right? I need all my gear. I have no gear. So, what's the lesson on this one? Sometimes you have to break all the rules, right? So I I, I borrowed every piece of equipment. All I had was what, was what I was wearing. So I had to bo borrow everything. So to to climb this peak. So. Oh, 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 sorry, I'm gonna ruin it here. Okay, so um, Mount McKinley is also known as Denali up in Alaska. So people ask, what's the hardest peak out of all of them? It's this one. So um, it has the most vertical relief, right? When you land at 7,000 feet and you're going up you know, to over 20,000 feet, it's brutal. Um, and you, you carry a 60 pound pack and you tow a 40 pound sled. So you're up there for 30 days. It's the coldest mountain on earth. So all the worst possible conditions that I experienced all happened on this mountain. So the most amount of snowfall in the least amount of time, uh, falling into two different crevasses, um, the highest winds, um, and also almost dying of hypothermia. So those are, so it took me four times to get to the summit of this peak. I went back four years. So some people say I'm insane, right? <laughs> I mean, who would do that? This, this mountain, I mean, if you can do this mountain, you can do Everest. 
So it's, it's a really, it's a man's man's mountain, right? Okay. Okay, so this is a, this is a, a Photoshop, right? So, but it's gonna, it's gonna show some, some pictures. So um, this is before, right? So the average guy that goes over to do Mount Everest weighs 185 pounds, has about 10% body fat. I mean, he's, he's probably trained his entire life for this. Um, and, and spent, how much does it cost to do Mount Everest alone? Just to give you an idea. The same as all those? No, so it's, it's just to climb this one, one shot at this is, is minimum $80,000. So if you don't get to the top of that the first time, I go, ching, right? You gotta go back and work <laughs> for a while to make, to make that. So, um, and, and I, didn't, I didn't sum it the first time. I went up the south side, which, which is on the Nepalese side, and it's all snow and ice. From, from base camp all the way to the summit, it's nothing but glacier and ice. So um, made it up to about 27,000 feet, weather turned south, and I said, I'm, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable. I turned around and came back. Now, most, most guys would not have done that, right? When you put that much time, that much energy, you have so much at stake that they, they get, you know, they call it um, summit fever. Right, they abandon all logic <laughs> and just head for the summit, you know, at their peril. So um, I didn't do that. So I turned around, came back, um, and then this was in 2007, and then 2008. What ha what happened in 2008? Does anybody? So it was the Olympics, right? And who was hosting the Olympics in 2008? The Chinese. So the Chinese had this great idea to carry a torch to the top of Mount Everest. So they own the north side of Mount Everest, so they closed it. So then everybody, everybody from the north side, you know, came over to the south side that year, and then they pressured the Nepalese government into closing the south side until their guy got to the summit and came back down. So essentially, nobody summited Everest in 2008. So I got the call three days. I trained for an entire year, right? My bags are packed. Hey, it's been canceled. I'm like, what would you, what was your first thought if somebody, I'd be like, yeah, whatever, right? You're joking, right? You can't close the mountain. It was closed. Didn't go. So I had to wait a whole nother year to 2009. And then I decided to do the north side. So the north side is completely opposite as the south side. This is all rock and rock climbing. I love rock and rock climbing. So, you know, I was able to get to the summit on that side. So, and again, when you, when you reach the summit, it's, it's, it's uh, maybe the word would be uh, like, like humility or being humbled. I mean, because it's, it's just the magnitude, right, of, of sitting on top and, and quite literally, right? Like you're sitting at the top of the world looking down. It's like the, the you know, you can imagine what, what God must see, right? It's just like, it, it's just, you, you it, it changes you. Yeah, it's, it's very, very profound. It was a beautiful day, 45 minutes at the top. You know, you, t you drink your water, eat a little food, take all your videos, your pictures, and then, you know, you still got to, you're only halfway there, right? You got to get back down. And then on this peak, on that side, because there's no snow, ice, or crevasses, all the bodies are up in plain sight. So not that you can't put them anywhere. So you can't take them down. So there's, there's probably no less than eight bodies that I counted. And it's, it, it's, it's always at the, like when you come to a point where there's a, where there's a rock drop off and you have to you know, turn around and, and climb down some ladders or something, there, there's always you know, a, a body at the bottom of that. And then your mind is like, right? I mean, <laughs> then you like get gripped and you're like, ah, you know, and then you're like, ah, you know, you're like yeah, so. It's very, very different over there. So, um, and then what I was mentioning about, you know, when you go over there looking all buff and great. So when you come back from that, the average guy comes back weighing 160 pounds. He loses 25 pounds in two months. And it's all muscle, right? Because he's got no body fat. So you, you come back, you're completely, you don't even recognize guys that you started with two months earlier. That's, that's the dramatic physical changes that happen. <laughs> This is a Photoshop too, but it's like, I mean, like, no kidding. This is what you look like. I mean, you come back and you're like, I mean, so it goes back to my original slide, right? That, that you want to you wanna stand at the top of the world. You want to feel, 
feel that experience and have that high, there's only one way to get there, right? I mean, you gotta, you gotta go through all the pain and suffering. So this is a, was a great, great lesson. So, um, yep, that was, that was kind of the, it for the presentation. I don't know if anybody has any specific questions they wanna ask. You've heard some things about doing elimination diets and how sometimes when you eliminate a whole food group from your diet, then your body will no longer make the enzymes necessary to digest that thing. And then if you try to reintroduce it, you have problems because of the lack of the enzymes. Is that something that just by taking extra enzymes you can avoid that problem? Or is that not really a problem? It's only your skin. Yeah, um, I would say that's not an issue, right? Because the the Obviously, the, the pancreas is going to produce, um, you know, the three main, there are really only three main enzymes, right? You have the enzymes that digest protein, the enzymes that digest carbohydrates, and the enzymes that digest fat. So the pancreas is always going to produce those, right? So, um, yeah, and, and some people talk about when you take a supplement, you, you supplement with a digestive enzyme, oh, your body stops making them. No, I mean, you want to preserve. I mean, if enzymes are energy, you want to preserve that energy, right? And if you look historically back at every indigenous culture that has ever lived and continues to live and follow their original traditions, what do they eat? It's, it's a fermentation of some sort. It's a raw fermented food. So there's no digestion required. That's the whole point. You eat it, it doesn't require any, any energy to digest. It's just immediately available and the body converts it and you have energy. So, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the single most important thing is when, it, when it comes to probably to any supplement that's out here, but, but especially with enzymes, is where do they come from? The source. So that's, that's, that's been my passion. And, and if enzymes didn't exist, I would be doing something else. I wouldn't be in the nutrition industry. So I mean, that's, and I've stayed true to that. So when I started the original enzyme company 25 years ago, 80% of what that company still does to this day are enzymes. The only thing we've really added to that are probiotics. So, um, and enzymes are, um, the, the, and what's happened originally is that most of the enzymes in the early days were animal based. The pancreatins, the trypsins, the chymotrypsins, all of that. That's where, the, that's where how enzymes were in, introduced. And then over the years, and it pretty much started in the early 1980s, where they started switching over to fermented enzymes. So that's where the, the vast majority, probably 90% of the enzymes, if you walk into any uh, health food store or, or uh, a doctor's office, they're going to be fermented enzymes. So those are done uh, mainly and, and originally in Japan. So Japan is the, is the master original fermentators, right? What was the first fer fermented food on the planet? Soy. Yeah, soy sauce. All right, so that was whatever, if that was a thousand or two thousand years ago, but they know how to do fermentation. So that's where I source all of my enzymes. So I go visit that facility, I know how they make them. I mean, I know everything about it, right? That's important because nine out of 10 companies, even more than that in the enzyme world, outsource their manufacturing and they outsource where they get the stuff. And most of the manufacturers don't even, they don't care. They just buy the cheapest stuff they can get. So. It, it, in that way, we're integrated. So I, I, I buy from very specific people in Japan. We bring them into this country. I do 100% of our own contract manufacturing. Nothing gets sent out. We do all of our own testing, and then we hand the product, you know, directly, you know, to the consumer. So as far as uh, um, shelf life, kind of gets into more the regulatory side of things. So if you look at the natural degradation of that enzyme activity, it, enzymes lose about 5% of their activity every year, just kind of naturally, right? So even if you had an enzyme that was 10 years old, how much activity would it still have? I'm just seeing how sharp you guys are. <laughs> 50%, right? Because 
10 years times 5% is 50. So 50% of the activity be gone, you still got 50% left. So it's, it's a slow process, right? They just kind of degrade slowly that way. And the other thing that they do is that when you combine enzymes together, some of the dominant enzymes start digesting and eating some of the, the, the not so dominant enzymes. So you see some reactions like that happen. So from a perspective from the FDA, you know, we put a two-year shelf life on there. That's, you know, standard. Could it be longer? Sure, it could easily be three years. But, you know, again, we just, you know, that, that example that you could keep them for 10 years, they're still 50% effective. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know much about enzymes. This has been fascinating. Um, how does one take, do you them with every meal? Is it a once a day script? Like, how, what's the, the application in real life? Um, so there are two categories or types, if you want to call it that. So you have your digestive enzymes. So those you want to take with food. Because essentially all we've done, like in that little picture with the, uh, the meat and potatoes, is we've cooked the enzymes out of that, right? Because the raw meat had enzymes, right? The raw potatoes had enzymes. Those are gone now, so you just take that enzyme with it. So it's present, and then the enzymes can digest and break that down. So that's important. So if you don't want to wait till after your meal to take it, because now You've, you've let your body and your pancreas produce enzymes. So as long as the enzymes are present there, your body won't produce them. And then the other type of enzymes are systemic or proteolytic, which means that they work more in the system. So then you take those a away from food on an empty stomach. So they'll pass through the stomach, be absorbed through the gut wall. They travel through the circulatory system. So they'll touch every organ, every tissue, every muscle. And, that's, and do they do the same things as the enzymes inside of your digestive system? Yeah, all those things we talked about. I mean, that they chew things up. So it could be, uh, um, Vaughn mentioned protein. I go, you know, uric acid is a byproduct of protein digestion. So that's being stored somewhere. It could be in your joints, could be in kidney stones. So the enzymes go in and digest that. Or arteriosclerosis or plaque. I go, same thing. It's just undigested food the body's storing. It goes in there and chews that up. So the, the main thing with, it, it gets more into therapeutic doses and, and making sure you're drinking lots of water. It's, you know, because if you have those issues and you take a bunch of enzymes, what's going to happen? It, it's like the can of soup where all this stuff is settled to the bottom and then you stir it all up, I go, you're probably going to get sick, right? So there's, there, you want to make sure that you're doing that in a certain way to, to prevent that. So you said that there's two different categories. Uh, which are the ones for the food? Digestive enzymes? Yeah. Yeah, those, those three are the main ones. Yeah, there's a bunch of other. So then what are, what are the ones for the systemic? The, well, those, yeah, those get into like um, serratiopeptidase, natokinase. So C there are different ones that target different Yes, systems? yeah, yeah. So that's, that's a little more beyond the scope of our talk today. But you can come up afterwards and, and, and feel free to uh, ask me some more questions about that, yeah. So are we, are we good on time? Well, is there one more question? Well, just related to systemic, I heard you say plaque. Would that be like plaque in your arteries? Yes, yeah. And so enzymes can actually break that down. Yep, yep. There was a, a doctor that did an 18-month study on that. And awesome. Yep. Which yep. would be the one that would uh, affect the plaque in the arteries? Um, serratiopeptidase or serapeptase? Which one? Serratiopeptidase, or just call it serapeptase. S-E-R-R-A-P-E-P-T-A-S-E. -E -E. Serapeptase. To, to a lesser degree, yeah. But, but the study was done on that, so it's, it's been proven with that enzyme, yeah. Right. So thank you.